Thank you, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to see a, a large number of you attending this morning. It's it's, it's awesome. I think um, you should have just kind of introduced us both there, which is, is much appreciated. Yeah, I, I lead the um, the authorizations and monitoring teams at ICAS across all um, regulatory areas, um, of which insolvency is obviously key. Um, but I also cover audit, AML, and, and practice as well. Um, this session is um, is brief, but there are a, a large number of areas that I've try, that we want to try and cover um, this morning, and there will be a bit of a Q and A session at the end. So, as Sean said, please um, please provide your questions, and we can try and cover as many of them as we can um, at the end of this uh, session. Um, I do have some slides here, um, but to be honest, they're more there just in case I go off on too many tangents. So um, we'll just to kind of focus the discussion and make sure that, that I'm being brought back to the key areas that I want to cover. Um, the focus is on a, a few areas. Some reminders um, for all IPs, um, a discussion on our monitoring activities and particularly how they've been impacted over the past um, 18 months or so, um, and also some of the common findings and common discussions um, that are coming out of our monitoring activities and our, our recent visits. With regards to that point, um, to be honest, we are finding less and less common themes, if you like, um, around the types of, of, of matters identified. And we're having more and more discussions about specific issues relating to specific IPs or uh, pieces of work, with the underlying causes stemming more from um, you know, management of cases and handling of, of documentation and just generally the sufficiency of documentation and evidence to support the work done. But we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that shortly. Just some reminders um, and for newer IPs, it's perhaps worth uh, as well going through some of the, the background to, to what we do. Um, and from a, an authorizations perspective as well. So ICAS is obviously a, an RPB, a recognized professional body, um, authorized um, to provide authorization to individuals to act as IPs. Um, we have had a, a large number of newer IPs in recent months, and a lot of the questions and queries that we're getting um, are from those individuals, and it's probably worth me just covering some of the, the background to this um, for, for everyone's information, but also specifically for, for that population. Um, in terms of um, what ICAS offers, um, so um, any individual who meets the eligibility requirements and eligibility criteria um, can apply to ICAS and indeed other RPBs for authorization as an IP. Um, ICAS can offer partial, full, or non-appointment taking licenses. Um, and we also authorize non-ICAS members. Um, so you don't have to be an ICAS member um, to come to us for, for, for that. Um, those individuals are called um, affiliates, and I'm sure there are a large number of, of you joining us this morning. In terms of the eligibility side of things, um, all of that can be found on the website, uh, as you can imagine. Um, but there are some key aspects. I mentioned either an ICAS member or an affiliate. Um, you should hold a practicing certificate if you are an ICAS member or a member of another professional body. There are various fit and proper confirmations and undertakings that have to be, have to be uh, completed. Um, various CPD requirements, including sufficient experience and GIEB exam passes at the requisite level. Further areas around PI cover, demonstrating compliance with the relevant uh, legislation and requirements, and confirming and undertaking to comply with ICAS's rules and regulations. So the Insolvency Service, who obviously over, oversee us, um, have a real focus on the IP population, as you can imagine. And it's a robust process and one which um, that, that is not taken lightly. And in order to enter the population of IPs, it, it can be a, 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 a difficult process, but we're here to help, we're here to guide, we're here to provide as much assistance as we can. And if anyone has any questions at all, then obviously feel free to, um, to get in touch. Um, once an individual has an IP license, um, you will be subject to ongoing monitoring. Um, you're required to undertake and maintain an element of CPD. And if you're an appointment taking license, ensure that you're complying with the, the bonding requirements or have an enabling bond in place. Um, and there should be also be timely lodging of Bordereau with ICAS. 
One of the areas I wanted to pick up on quite early on here this morning is around um, anti-money laundering supervision. This is by far the most common question that we've had in the last couple of months from individuals and indeed from, from firms and practices around whether they are supervised by ICAS or another supervisory body. Um, should they be supervised by ICAS and, and what are the implications um, of all of this? And particularly where an IP is perhaps moving from one organization to another or, or setting up on their own, um, it is key that, that you consider and confirm that you are indeed supervised for AML and who that AML supervisor is. Um, at the risk of sounding too heavy handed, which um, I know we've been uh, accused of before from a regulatory perspective, but at the risk of that, it can be a criminal offence to operate without this supervision. So it's imperative that as an IP, you ensure that the firm you're either leading or employed within is subject to AML supervision by one of the supervisory bodies. For the most part, it can be straightforward. Um, if a firm has a majority of ICAST members as partners or principals, or a sole practitioner who's an ICAST member, ICAS will, of course, be the default AML supervisor. Outside of the insolvency world, um, firms that don't have that majority ICAS membership and isn't regulated by ICAS for any other purpose would go elsewhere for AML supervision, perhaps HMRC or another one of the, the bodies. However, by virtue of the fact that an individual is an ICAS affiliate IP, for example, that firm can be brought under ICAS AML supervision even where the majority of members uh, and principals aren't uh, ICAS. If there's anyone who has any questions about this at all or is unsure who your AML supervisor is, whether you think it's ICAS or shouldn't be, then we're on hand. We can, you know, please get in touch and please let us know and we can guide you and talk you through that process. Um, in order to be AML supervised by ICAS, you would have had to undertake another fairly robust application process. So if you haven't gone through that, the likelihood is that, that you're not supervised by ICAS, but actually um, you might, uh, or you, sorry, you should be. So please, um, please get in touch if you're at all unsure about that. Moving on to the monitoring side of things. Um, every RPB of which ICAS is one is obviously required to regulate and have oversight over the IP population and ICAS conducts its monitoring activities to ensure that IPs are fit and proper, that they meet the acceptable CPD and experience standards, and conducting work in accordance with the various requirements and standards. ICAS is around 85 to 87 IPs currently, and we conduct between 15 to 20 visits each year. Um, the Insolvency Service, who I mentioned, have oversight and regulation over our activities. They conduct their own review of our work, um, and indeed they conducted a remote um, review of that in 2020. Um, and they will regularly um, have oversight over the work that we, that we do. And we maintain regular contact with the insolvency service as part of that relationship. As most of you will be aware, um, about 24 months ago or so, we commenced an engagement with ICAW Insolvency Monitoring to outsource the on-site monitoring of our IPs, um, with those visits being carried out by ICAW reviewers. However, the oversight and ultimate responsibility is obviously retained um, by ICAS. And prior to COVID, we conducted our visits on an on-site basis, but that's obviously been significantly impacted in the last 18 months or so. Um, and perhaps at this point, I'll pass over to Alison, who can discuss with us a little bit about the visit process generally um, and also um, the impact of COVID on our activities in the last year or so. Thank you, Kenny. Um, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, I head up ICW's monitoring team. And as Kenny has said, I've been working with ICA since um, mid 2019 to deliver monitoring visits to ICAS as IPs. Sorry, I've got <laughs> I've got some feedback, so it's putting me off slightly. As Kenny said, uh, since COVID started, we've had to conduct um, monitoring reviews remotely. So we've done that either by getting hold of hard copy files, if that's what you use, or by linking into a virtual system. Um, 
it's been really success successful and that's what we've done both on our own monitoring visits and also the ICAS monitoring visits. I think the slight downside is that those visits do take a little bit longer, particularly if you've got hard copy files, um, because you need to get your files back before you can respond to our queries. But we have actually been able to get all the visits that we needed to get done during that period done. So I would like to say thank you very much to any IPAs listening today who've had remote monitoring visits in this period and out of work with us to be able to deliver those. Um, I was also going to talk very briefly about what the visit process would look like. Um, the process is very similar both for the remote visits and the on-site visits. Um, essentially, you'll be first contacted by a reviewer to set up the visit. So that will be by telephone. And that will generally be done six to 10 weeks ahead of the visit date. And during that phone conversation, the reviewer will want to talk to you about your caseload, um, just to get a feel for the number and types of cases that you're dealing with. Once we've agreed a visit date, um, you'll then be asked to provide some pre-visit information. Um, that's essentially an an analysis of your cases, a list of the cases open and those that have been closed in the last 12 months, details of the funds that you're holding on those cases and also the bond levels. And then once we've got that pre-visit information, we'll be able to select the cases that we want to re review during the monitoring visit. The visit itself will start with an opening meeting and that meeting will be um, to really get a feel for the systems and processes that you use to handle your insolvency cases. And we'll also talk about your staffing, training uh, and issues like that. We will then carry out some file reviews and if there are queries coming out we'll raise those on a Word document. We will ask for a written response to those queries but we also really want to discuss those queries with you. And it's really important, those discussions as we go along. I think it then makes the closing meeting at the end of the visit much more straightforward. Forward. And I think that's the area that's been a bit more difficult as we've done the visits remotely, because it's it's less easy to, you obviously can't put your pop your head around the door and say, can you find this? Could you explain this to me? Um, but we have been able to have those discussions over Teams or telephone calls, but it's just a little bit more difficult. And then the visit itself will conclude with a closing meeting. And that closing meeting will discuss a written high level summary of the issues that have come out of the visit. We'll then ask for responses to that um, closing record to come in within 15 business days of the submission of the record. And we really want your responses to that record to explain how you're going to deal with any high level issues coming out of the visit, what changes you're going to make or have already made. And it's helpful if you can provide evidence of any changes that you've already made. The visit will then end uh, by issue of a report to ICAS and Kelly will then pick up further communication with you. Thank you, Alison. Um, much appreciated. And I appreciate you've got some um, technical issues there with the feedback. So um, well done in, um, in, in pushing through that. So that's that's much appreciated. Hopefully that gives everyone an insight into the um, process um, where uh, a visit is undertaken, and particularly during the last 12, 12 to 18 months during COVID. As Alison had mentioned, um, the the um, engagement that we've had with the IPs has been fantastic during this period. So thank you to everyone who's who's allowed us to continue with our regulatory activities during what has been a particularly busy and difficult time for, for everyone um, during this period. Um, I had mentioned before that ICAS retains the oversight and responsibility of monitoring um, whilst ICW are conducting the face-to-face the -face, um, visits. 
or not, as the case may be. Um, the authorization committee has oversight over all regulation and monitoring activity, including authorizations um, and review of any visits, um, any follow-up action, et cetera, et cetera. And it's that committee that takes any decision following um, a, a monitoring activity, either in respect of what action it should take or any follow-up action required by the IP. The committee itself is made up of practicing members, including IPs, and a number of lay members who protect the public interest and to provide um, what is often needed in terms of a balanced and pragmatic uh, view, which um, allows for the, uh, the committee to work in an effective and indeed independent way. In terms of some of the common findings, um, as, as we've both mentioned already, we've, we've all felt the significant impact over the past year or so. Um, and due to the timing of our monitoring and some of the work that we've looked at, which can often predate um, the, the restrictions and the lockdown, we're still expecting the biggest impact on compliance to be seen for the coming period and perhaps for a considerable period of time. So um, we are fully geared up and fully prepared that, that, that IPs have perhaps had difficulty in maintaining a level of compliance during what has been a particularly difficult time. And we will keep that in mind as we conduct our activities going forward. I had mentioned earlier that in the, the last couple of years, whilst there haven't been any significant common trends in relation to the findings, um, there have been in relation to perhaps the underlying causes and the underlying issues. Um, of course, we have identified IP-specific issues that have resulted in, in some of the, the discussion points. Um, we've also seen a number of cases where case management and handling um, has resulted in some follow-up action for IPs and just generally um, the documentation of, of work done. And a couple of the points I'm going to come on to uh, next, you could probably broadly categorise as being um, thought of as basics in relation to the conduct and recording of work. And, and we often see the frustration when we're talking to IPs that, you know, they're talking to us and they can explain exactly what has been done, what considerations were made, what meetings were held, but the evidence and documentation of that isn't, isn't available. And I think there's a, there's a common discussion point here, not just in relation to insolvency, but I think um, compliance generally within all practice areas. Um, but definitely within within some of our IP population, where it's perhaps time to just get back to basics, if that makes sense, and ensuring that areas where an IP is perhaps assuming someone who's got delegated authority to conduct some work has been conducting that work effectively and documenting it in, in, in accordance with the, the standards, but just to, to double check that, what we're seeing is that the types of issues and the types of discussions that we're, we're discussing with IPs they're not necessarily um, as a consequence of the difficulties that we've all had over the last 12 to 18 months. And indeed, quite often, they're not that complex. And it makes us think that there's just probably an argument there to say, get back to basics, think about um, the documentation of work and ensure that there's sufficient evidence um, on file to demonstrate the conclusions um, that are reached. Um, in relation to some specifics, uh, we've seen some kind of unnecessary delays in the recovery of assets and distributing of funds to creditors. Um, some instances of missed dividend declaration deadlines, incorrect calculation of claims. And uh, as a reminder, actually, on that, when a reviewer um, identifies um, where there are claims or distributions incorrectly calculated, there is an expectation that the IP corrects that position. And I have to say that, you know, quite often that, that is done while the reviewer is still conducting the work. And by the time it reaches um, for final review or consideration by the committee, the action has been undertaken. And obviously the committee is, is pleased to see when that's the case. One area to consider uh, is in relation to, to SIP 11 and the handling of funds. Um, while that has, SIP has been in place for a while now, um, it's worth taking some time to re-familiarise re yourself with the requirements and consider if the controls in place are indeed adequate and uh, address the specific requirements. We have had a couple of occasions in the last year or so where we've, looked, we've identified um, specific areas where controls have been lacking and perhaps need to be uh, improved. 
Some other um, areas for consideration, um, again, some of these are, may sound very basic to people, but it's, it's you know, reinforcing the message of, of getting back to basics. We've seen some incorrect bonding calculations, um, a lack of notes or minutes from uh, significant meetings, um, and some concerns in, in a couple of areas where that the control that some IPs have over work conducted by others and the review of that work um, has perhaps resulted in uh, perhaps been an underlying cause for some of the, the issues discussed. I do appreciate that the, the, the very nature of this discussion is, a, is, is, is kind of negative, but I think it's, it's, it's quite useful, hopefully, to, to demonstrate some of these key findings so that even if you think that you're doing this appropriately and think that you're doing all of these areas effectively, it might trigger a reminder to, to revisit that in, in all cases. Whilst not on the slide, there's, it's probably also worth reminding everyone that SIP 16 statements should be submitted to ICAS for reference and review, um, wh where an ICAS IP is the lead on the work. I appreciate there haven't been many of those recently, but it, it's again just worth um, a reminder. Um, and I, I, you know, when I say there haven't been many, I, I think in 2020 um, there was less than, than double figures. So we're not talking about a huge number here, but just useful to, to serve as a reminder. Um, something else on the slide in relation to GDPR, it's probably worth picking up. Um, IPs have in the main addressed firm-wide GDPR matters, um, but we're still seeing instances where there's perhaps a, a lack of consideration over personal data and the security of this. Um, where the controls in place and the, the 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 protection of that data could perhaps be improved. And as a further reminder to that, um, please also check that you're appropriately registered with the ICO in relation to the, the type of work that you do and the, the type of data that you hold and, uh, and require to have secure. Hopefully Alison's resolved her audio issues and I'll perhaps pass back. Um, I know Alison, you were quite keen to perhaps talk about the IV sector and a couple of aspects of that, which might be of relevance and of interest to the, the guys this morning. No, I was. And apologies um, for the, the sound quality earlier. It, it was quite difficult, <laughs> um, but it's resolved now. Um, and I would just, before I move on to the IVA sector, just echo a couple of things that um, Kenny's just said. Um, the closing record that we produce at the end of the visit is an exception report. So as Kenny just alluded to, that the points are points that need addressing. It doesn't tend to be uh, balanced. It is just an exception report. So it's highlighting issues that need to be addressed. Um, and as yet, we're not really seeing a lot of issues that have um, come around because of COVID, just because of the timing and the age of the cases we look at. But I suspect that's going to be addressed in the next um, few months, to be honest. Um, in terms of the IVA sector, um, it's very much a focus of the insolvency service at the moment and has been probably for the last um, 12 months at least. And there's regular dialogue with both the insolvency service, all of the RPBs and the FCA. Um, and that culminated in a DRIP coming out in February 2021, um, which really reminded IPs that they are responsible where they're obtaining appointments via a third party. So a lead generator, um, somebody else's website, that the IP is responsible for the advertisement, the marketing and the compliance with the code of ethics. And then we've seen some direct action taken um, this year, both by the ASA, who um, came out with some rulings uh, in February about misleading advertisement, and also by the FCA in July when they removed authorization from um, five lead generators. So it's really crucial that uh, IPs who are working in this sector are doing due diligence on the people that they are taking referrals from, that they're looking at their websites, they're looking at the quality of the advice that those people give, but also that they're ensuring that both of those are updated regularly. I think certainly we see that websites can change very, very quickly, and there's been a lot of focus on, on inappropriate content on websites, particularly um, sort of large headline write-offs that then when they get queried on a visit, um, the, the lead generator or the IP can't substantiate as being um, reflective of current practice. So yeah, that's very much um, a big hot topic at the moment. I think that's likely to continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Shall I hand back to Kenny? Perfect. Thank you, Alison. Much appreciated. Um, 
Yes, so I, I'm always conscious when, when we're talking about or presenting a session like this or talking about monitoring or in any way that, that we can come across as very negative. But um, hopefully, as Alison said there, whilst the, the document that is produced as an exceptions report and does show the areas for improvement and areas of focus, um, through the process, the reviewers will try and produce a, a kind of balanced um, view uh, and, and certainly comment on some good practice as well. So whilst I don't unfortunately have a slide on the good practice here, um, hopefully those that have gone through the process will know that that, that, that happens. ICAS is also here in terms of providing support. So um, perhaps you might feel as if we're, we're a bit too much stick and not enough carrot, but there's certainly some support there for, for our IP population. Um, and I think what was well received from talking to our population was around the response to the COVID pandemic and particularly the, the, the COVID hub and the Ask ICAS webinar series. I'm sure over the course of this morning and indeed tomorrow, there'll be more reference of that, but it, it's useful to, to reiterate that um, the support team did a, a sterling job to, um, you know, produce some guidance to, 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 you know, give some support, and uh, and the Ask ICAST weekly webinar series has been really well received. There's also a technical helpline which you can access through the website if anyone has any technical concerns or technical issues. Um, the ICAST general practice manual, which was free of charge and prepared by um, the ICAST practice support team, is available, and also. I've talked about money laundering already this morning. If anyone has any concerns about a, a specific instance or issue, um, you can use the confidential helpline to um, um, to get some guidance and advice on any money laundering aspect. They will keep things anonymous and they will um, they will ask for that specifically, but they can certainly give you guidance and support if you have any specific questions in that regard. And that's a kind of whistle stop tour of authorizations and monitoring. Um, conscious we've only got about 10 minutes or so left, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that people have at this stage. Um, and Alison's on hand as well. So we're, we're both here to answer any questions if you want to type them into the, the question box. Um, and uh, yeah, more than happy to do so at the moment. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Um, first question. I noticed that anti-money laundering didn't appear on that list of common issues and I know that that's something that always has appeared in recent years on the, the list of common issues and I also know that ICAS as a whole, so out with the insolvency sphere, it's something that firms aren't getting quite right. Uh, are insolvency practitioners doing it better now? <laughs> um, I would love to say yes. <laughs> um, I think it's just by virtue of the way that I've created those slides. So, so, so I covered the AML in the reminders slide rather than the common issues slide. AML still is the top of the list on most of the conversations we have with any of our um, regulated population, whether it be an IP, an audit firm, a general practitioner, um, or the like. So um, the one thing I would say is that we have great sympathy with our population because the goalposts keep moving. So we may have visited an IP or a firm um, under another regulatory guise a couple of years ago, and they address the points at that point. And then we come along a couple of years later and say, well, actually, the guidance and the regulations have changed slightly, or OPBAS, who is the, the new oversight regulator that's been in place for what, three or four years now, has an emphasis or a focus on, a, on another specific area. So I have great sympathy with our population and the fact that um, this is going in one direction only. It's ramping up quite significantly. Mm -hmm. And whereas you may feel quite content and quite comfortable after a monitoring visit that you've addressed all of the issues, there can be no standing still. And unfortunately, things move on quite rapidly and have done so in the last couple of years. So I, I, I would love to say that, that you know, IPs or, or others regulated with ICAS are doing things mm -hmm. better. But I think what I would say is that the awareness has significantly improved. Um, and I know personally from talking to to our population perhaps five or six years ago when that awareness was quite low and it was probably seen as more of a tick boxing exercise um, that has significantly moved on and I think the the significance and the emphasis on this is now at the level it should be what's happened what needs to happen now is that the procedures and the documentation in place to support that is is evidenced and that's where we are at the moment okay thanks 
Um, we have a, it's quite a specific question from somebody who I believe is on the other side of the world who got up in the middle of the night, especially to uh, <laughs> attend this, this conference today. But it's the monitoring requirements for um, IPs who take appointments in non-UK jurisdictions and on non-UK legislation. And I don't know if this is, Alison, maybe a trip to the Cayman Islands for one of your one of your team <laughs> or how that, that would work in, in practice. Um, so, I mean, Alison, I don't know if you've got any initial thoughts on that one. I know certainly um, our approach would be that that would fall under our sort of practice assurance or practice review type scheme because it's not falling within the license that the, the IP needs um, to do to do UK work. And yeah, and even, even, at, even we'd be the same, but even at that point, it would depend on the, the jurisdiction and the types of services and types of activities yeah. that that individual has undertaken. Um, it's, you know, I can actually see that question and perhaps it's worth picking up with um, that individual after after today. But, um, you know, it would depend on the, the type of license that's held, whether indeed it's a, a UK license and they happen to be located overseas. It could be someone who's based in the UK, but is, you know, is, is, is you know, seeking overseas work. But that, as Alison had said, that wouldn't necessarily fall within the, under the UK regime. So. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's a bit of a depends on the circumstance <laughs> question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I think just on the, I suppose it's a remote visit or a visit visit in person. I can, you know, from what you're saying, there, there's been some advantages, um, but also some disadvantages. Post COVID, should we ever get there? What are your personal views on what the monitoring process is, is likely to be like in terms of that, you know, virtual or or in person? Yeah, I think from a, um, I don't think we're going to go back to the way we were before. I think there, there has to be lessons learned. Um, I think through this piece, we've been able to identify what works well off site and what we actually do need to do face to face with someone. Um, you know, using video conferencing calls and, and uh, you know, getting things remotely has been effective um, to a large extent, but things take much longer. And there's a bit of a, and out of sight, out of mind sometimes. Um, and, and this seems unfair, actually. Um, the entire population has had a huge, um, you know, huge difficulties and, and significant issues to deal with. So if we're not sit physically situated or located in the office, then there are other priorities, and that is completely yeah. understandable. But the knock-on effect is that things can take longer. But I, I would say we are, you know, across all regimes, we are currently looking into what a hybrid approach looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the bottom line is we, we won't revert back to the exact state that we had before. Okay, thanks. Um, can you please just go over what the monitoring cycle is in terms of when should a new IP expect to visit and then how often and, and, and when the, the cycle runs after that? Of course. So for new IPs, we would look to, to visit them as quickly as possible, subject to the caseload and uh, any work that we could review. But certainly about, with about 18 to 24 months, a new IP would expect a visit. Thereafter, the broad strokes is that the maximum that we would leave an IP who's not a high volume provider would be six years. But very rarely would we leave an IP for that long. Um, and the average tends to be about a three year period. Um, we take a risk-based approach to our selection and if an IP starts undertaking a significant additional amount of work um, or vice versa, it can have an impact on the timing and the risk assessment um, of that. And there are other factors that we take into consideration in terms of any other changes within the, the, the firm, um, any changes within the controls and the procedures, but we take a risk-based approach. Um, but that, that would broadly be the timelines that people would expect to receive a visit. Yeah, and so I just want to cl clarify that just one one point on that. If an IP is subject to a monitoring visit, and as a consequence of that, is subject to perhaps some fairly robust or stringent follow up action, that may result in a follow up visit um, to that IP, and that can often the committee can often ask for the IP to pay for that follow up visit. The cost itself isn't significant, but um, there is a potentially a, a financial aspect to having that follow up visit undertaken. Okay, and you mentioned their robust and stringent follow-up action. What sort of things would that? What does that look like? 
yeah, obviously on a case by case basis, and Alison, you can jump in in terms of the most common things. But um, recently, what we've been doing is, in addition to perhaps a follow up visit, we've been asking for various confirmations and undertakings from the IP specific to the findings. Um, we may also ask for monthly updates or progress against findings from a monitoring visit, um, including changes to controls, changes to procedures, progress of cases, which has been a couple of instances in the last 12 months or so, making sure that the IP is on top of the caseload and on top of the case management and that we're seeing progress being made. And I know in ICW have, have a, a process where IPs are required to have a kind of annual compliance review in Scotland, we don't have that, but we're now asking as part of the follow-up action in some instances where a third party should be engaged with to conduct uh, an element of a compliance review um, in between the visit and the follow-up visit that, that, that the monitor would conduct. Yeah, no, I think the follow-up sometimes, there, there might be very specific issues on an individual visit where we feel that there needs to be some follow-up, as, as Kenny suggested, perhaps on, on case progression, making sure that something is is actually moving forward as it should be. But it's very much um, sort of considered on a visit by visit basis, really. It's quite individual, I think, in some cases, the follow-up that's, that's suggested. Okay, thank you. Um, I've seen in the press that ICAW has sought revocation of its um, recognised accountancy body in Ireland and I just wondered, um, I suppose Kenny, one for you, what ICAS are planning on doing and does that have any implication for IPs that are regulated uh, by ICAS in, in Ireland? Yes and yes. Uh, um, <laughs> so ICW at the start of the year um, did publicise that they were seeking revocation and I think the recent publication uh, pub uh, statement had said that had happened. Um, independently of that, I have to say, it wasn't as a consequence of that, independently of that, following Brexit, following the general divergence of regulations and standards between Ireland and the UK across multiple regulatory regimes, um, ICAS and approved by the, the Board and Council have taken the decision to um, seek revocation of its RAB status um, in Ireland. and. The, the driving factor has principally been on the audit side of things, but there are knock-on effects for the for the IP population. Um, so any insolvency practitioner who is undertaking work in Ireland, um, once ICAS has had has re has revoked its RAB and PAB status in Ireland, will have to have some reciprocal membership with one of the bodies that has retained RAB or PAB status. Um, so we have engaged conversations with the Irish Institute on this and to try and, ease, to try and make things as, as smooth as possible for those individuals. We've also contacted directly those individuals of which the, the population at the moment is very, very small. We're, you know, I think it's just a handful of individuals mm. that we know of who will be impacted by this. But we have contacted, contacted them directly to, to inform them of what is happening and what they need to do next. And we will, we will guide them through that process to make sure that there's no additional bur significant burden or, or impact on those individuals. Um, but it is a consequence of, as I say, the, di the divergence in regulatory standards between Ireland and the UK following Brexit and the, the various uh, aspects of that. So most of the people we've spoken to were anticipating and expecting this, but yes, that there will be an impact. And, and if anyone is listening to this who hasn't been contacted and thinks that they will be impacted, um, please come to me directly and um, I, I can talk you through the process. Okay, um, a final question, I think, just on the, um, the, the the fact that the visits are taking longer now. I think a, a few, a couple of months ago, I saw some stats for the current year for ICAS's monitoring programme and how far ICAS were through, and it looked like you you hadn't got very far uh, through the, the scheduled visits. Um, how's that? How's that going? And do you do you? You know, are you confident that you'll manage to get them all, all completed in time? I mean, the answer to the last question is yes. I, the, 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 the timing of all of this is predicated by whatever government guidance is, is available at the time. Um, things are taking longer of that, there is absolutely no doubt. But there's been so far no impact on the number of visits against what our targets and what our requirements are concerned. Um, so if anyone has any concern about that, we can ease that concern now. Um, so yeah, by the time we get to the year end and indeed then completion of visits into next year, 
um, we will have a we'll will have completed what our plan school. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for for that. All very interesting, and the key takeaway from me is remember to document decisions so that the evidence <laughs> is on the file. Um, so yes, I will try and remember that. Um, okay, so so thank you very much. And